Hi everyone, this is Liz Stanton at Synapse Energy Economics, and I am here in a room at Synapse with Pat Knight and Larry Cretion, and we're going to have a great webinar coming up for you. Uh, I want to go over a little bit of logistics before we get launched. Uh, so, to some of you this is familiar, I'll go through it nonetheless. When we do our webinars, uh, we are recording the audio and we will send that out to all of you that are on the line right now along with the slides to the presentation. We're also going to post that up on our website, so you'll be able to find that there and you can find all of our past webinars also up on our website, audio and slides. We have muted all participants. Uh, that's the way we do our webinars, so everybody out there is muted except for the folks in the room here. And uh, please understand that we do want to hear your questions, but the way to get those questions to me is by sending them to me in an email. So I know that the webinar uh, WebEx software that you're using has a chat function. We use that chat function to let us know about your technical problems. So if you're having something wrong with audio or visual, please use the chat function to try to work that out. For questions that are about the topic of the webinar, which I hope that everyone out there will, will send along, please use our webinar at synapse-energy.com email address. I'm going to be the moderator for today's webinar and I will be keeping track of your questions as we go along and after our presenters are, are finished uh, presenting, then I'll begin to ask your questions of them while still keeping an eye out for new questions coming in. Uh, so those are the basics of the logistics. Let me introduce our uh, panelists today. Uh, we have two great speakers that are going to be leading us through a discussion of uh, recent import important uh, things that have happened in New England and Reggie. So, We'll be talking a little bit about the Reggie stakeholder process and some information that can be helpful in that. We're also going to be talking about the Massachusetts uh, SJC decision that was just recently announced. Um, all very important uh, um, current events in New England and the Reggie region. So our first presenter will be Synapse's own uh, Pat Knight. He's a senior associate here and one of our key experts on uh, the Clean Power Plan, as well as other emission reduction uh, programs and regulations. He's also the designer of many of our in-house Synapse tools. Quite a few of we've made public and you can download on our website. So you're going to want to check those out if you haven't seen them already. We also have uh, today a guest presenter. We have Larry Cretion, who is the Executive Director of the Mass Energy Consumers Alliance. And we're so glad that Larry could join us. Uh, for those of you that uh, don't know Mass Energy, it's a nonprofit organization with a mission to make more energy, uh, more, to make energy more affordable and environmentally sustainable. And uh, you see a little bit of information up here on the slides about both of our organizations and the, the presenters may have more to say, but at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Pat and Larry who will be talking for maybe the next 25 minutes or half an hour or so and then we'll dive into questions. Pat? So thanks for that introduction, Liz. Um, so as Liz was just alluding to, today we're going to be topic, talking about two kind of separate but uh, very interrelated topics. Uh, first, I'll be talking about REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and I'll be focusing on a recent report that Synapse released called the REGI Opportunity. And uh, in that little discussion, I'll be talking about what our findings were from the REGI Opportunity uh, as they relate to emission reductions per, per year. And uh, basically, the key point that you can take away from this is we found that the electric sector uh, can achieve 5% emission reductions per year and that will get many states uh, in the Northeast to their climate reduction targets by the year 2030. After that, I'm going to turn things over to Larry who will be talking about the SJC's decision and the Massachusetts uh, GOESA and then as Liz said, we'll, we'll get into some questions and answers. So first, Let's talk about the Reggie opportunity. So I'll get into the specifics of Reggie in just a second, but 
First, very briefly, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI, is a cap and trade program entered into by nine northeastern states uh, in an effort to reduce CO2 emissions from the electric sector. Uh, over the past seven years, these states have uh, made some key strides in uh, reducing emissions. In the electric sector, uh, emissions in these nine states has been reduced by 45% compared to 1990 levels. So as I was just saying, REGI is all about the electric sector, but if you step back, these states have actually achieved considerable emission reductions from other sectors, namely from buildings and transportation, and are now at levels of 20% below uh, 1990 levels of CO2 emissions. So uh, REGI has been a, uh, a key instrument in achieving uh, greenhouse gas reductions in these nine states, but it's not the only policy. Uh, most, if not all, of these nine states have complementary policies aimed at requiring specific targets to be met in terms of levels of energy efficiency and renewables, uh, commonly called ERS and RPS. Uh, each of these states also have established long-term economy-wide climate goals, which together cluster around about 40% emission reduction compared to 1990 levels by 2030 and 80% by 2050. Uh, except for Delaware, uh, each one of these goals is binding. In other words, these states are legally mandated or legally required to meet these emission reductions. And this is a key part of what Larry will be talking about in just a few minutes. Starting late last year in 2015, uh, we were contracted by Sierra Club to model pathways to achieving emission reductions that would allow these nine state, uh, this nine state region to meet their legally required emission reductions. And uh, for a little bit of the context of the background here, uh, this is the year of the REGI stakeholder process. The 2016 REGI stakeholder process is occurring kind of as we speak. Um, and this is a process by which every few years uh, REGI stakeholders meet to decide what, if any, changes to make to the program. So uh, this modeling was was when we were pursuing this model, we were looking to help inform the ongoing REGI stakeholder process in terms of what could be done to the electric sector. But we were also looking to understand what possible emission reductions uh, could be achieved in the sectors untouched by REGI, that is the residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation sectors. So in our REGI Opportunity 2.0 report, we modeled a future in which six strategies, or as we call them shifts, were undertaken to achieve the 40% below 1990 requirements. This here is a chart uh, showing emissions over time. Uh, at the top of the chart, you can see this flat line, and that indicates the level of emissions in 1990. And we've also got this line under here, which shows the target for these nine states, 40% below 1990. Uh, here are the historical emissions. You can see how they've decreased, then increased, then decreased again. And you can also see how we've modeled a baseline or reference case out into the future, uh, where we're looking at what we think the emissions are going to be like in these nine states in a kind of business as usual scenario, a scenario in which there are no incremental policies beyond which are currently on the books. So on top of that baseline scenario, uh, we looked at six different shifts that can achieve significant emission reductions for these nine states. And here our shifts included the electrification of light duty vehicles, implementation of heat pumps, energy efficiency in both the electric sector and uh, homes and businesses that use direct natural gas, uh, heating and water heating, and also an expansion of wind and solar generation in the nine REGI states. So some of these strategies have emission impacts outside of the electric sector. Some of them have emissions impacts only within the electric sector. And there's a couple of them that actually cross sectors. Uh, but just to dive into the electric sector specifically for a minute, uh, we found that based on the strategies we looked at here, we found that the electric sector could be responsible for about one half of all of the required emissions uh, by the year 2030. And one way to achieve uh, this level of emission reductions would be to uh, lower the cap on allowed emissions within REGI. So we found that the REGI state's climate laws ultimately require a reduction in electric sector CO2 emissions of 5% per year from 2020 to 2030. 
And to say that another way, while REGI currently has a decrease in emissions between 2014 and 2020 of 2.5% per year, our modeling doubles that rate to 5% in order to achieve the emission reduction targets of 40% below 1990 by the year 2030. So uh, just to pause here and talk a little bit about uh, REGI itself, um, one thing that most people seem to know about REGI is that it's a mechanism to limit greenhouse gas emissions in the electric sector. REGI imposes a fixed, not to be exceeded limit on emissions in the region as a whole, and then allows individual emitters in that region to trade emission allowances with each other. This means that REGI itself is responsible for imposing a cap that eventually leads to decreased emissions. So that's kind of the core part of REGI, but REGI actually has a number of possibly lesser known functions that also help to reduce overall emissions. So uh, the first one is about REGI's role as, as a fundraising device. Four times a year, the nine states and REGI each conduct an auction wherein emitters within those states must bid on and purchase emission allowances. Through these auctions, the states each raise money. And how this money gets used differs depending on what state you're in. Some states actually take a part of those funds and refund it directly to customers. Uh, but for the most part, these funds get used to uh, help assist energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. In 2015 alone, $436 million were raised in REGI auctions, the lion's share of which went to fund energy efficiency and renewables. So, uh, you can kind of look at it like this. Uh, because of this funding mechanism, REGI actually comes at the emissions, uh, emissions problem from two different sides. It imposes a cap, but then it also serves as a mechanism to provide funding to lift up energy efficiency and renewables to resources which help to uh, assist the nine state region towards a lower emissions future. REGI is also a driver of longer term changes. Um, perhaps the most well-known driver of this is the way that REGI affects energy prices. Since fossil fuel plants must purchase allowances, the price of generating a megawatt hour of electricity from these, uh, from these plants is greater in a world with REGI than in a hypothetical world where REGI does not exist. And this increase in prices has the effect of shifting generation away from high emitting sources like coal to lower emitting sources like natural gas. However, that can really only go so far, um, and I suppose that's good news depending on who you are. In 2015, only 7% of the REGI region's generation came from coal. So eventually, all of this high emitting generation will be pushed out, and natural gas will be the only resource left in the REGI region that is affected negatively price-wise by REGI. However, that said, REGI will continue to impact the type of resources we get electricity from. Because in addition to affecting short-term energy prices, REGI helps to drive down long-term capacity prices, which helps to discourage investment in additional fossil fuel infrastructure by way of encouraging investment in energy efficiency and renewables. So that's a little bit about our recent REGI report and sort of the role of REGI, not just in as a capping mechanism, but also as a fundraising and price suppressing mechanism. Uh, next, I'm going to turn it over to Larry, who again is uh, going to go into the details of the recent SJC decision on the Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act. Okay, uh, thank you, Pat. Um, so the common thread in today's uh, webinar is about uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, focusing on Massachusetts, uh, back in uh, 2014, uh, we started talking to the Conservation Law Foundation about the fact that uh, the Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act uh, requires the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection to write regulations that would uh, effectuate declining aggregate emissions uh, of greenhouse gases on an annual basis. Um, the, the 2008 law said that the regulations had to be written by January 1st, 2012 to go into effect on January 1st of 2013. In 2014, they were obviously quite behind. Um, so we filed the suit um, that more recently went to the Supreme Judicial Court. Oral arguments were held on uh, January 8th. Uh, the Conservation Law Foundation did a great job uh, making our case as, as plaintiffs. Uh, we were also joined in the suit by 14 teenagers affiliated with uh, our Children's uh, Trust. 
Um, and so on May 17th, we were absolutely thrilled to see that the uh, Supreme Judicial Court ruled unanimously uh, in favor of the position that uh, CLF had articulated. Uh, and so as a result, um, the Department of Environmental Protection now has the job of having to write regulations um, that uh, will cause, uh, the key words are uh, to ensure that there will be declining aggregate emissions on an annual basis. And so there needs to be a schedule of emission reductions uh, from where we are today uh, to going down to 25 percent by 2020. Uh, most people are aware that the Global Warming Solutions Act actually has elements that get us to 80 percent by 2050, uh, but the regulations in question are going to uh, be about 25 percent by 2020. It's the first interim step along the way. Um, in our view, it's critical. If we're going to re be serious about reducing carbon emissions over any period of time, particularly 80 percent by 2050, we can't be missing um, the uh, milestones along the way, particularly where uh, we believe that we have every opportunity to achieve 25% uh, by 2020. I think that Synapse and others have pointed out that we can actually probably improve the gross domestic product of Massachusetts if we uh, choose our policies carefully. Um, so uh, we have since read and heard that uh, the administration is going to be uh, having a stakeholder process and they'll be working on these regulations over the next uh, few months. Uh, we're hoping that uh, they will focus very heavily on more energy efficiency, uh, which is uh, absolutely beneficial for the state's economy. We're, we think there's opportunities uh, for expansion. We think there's an opportunity here for more clean energy procurement, uh, such as uh, you know, class one renewables uh, and, and hydro. Uh, we think that uh, any idea of bringing in natural gas, such as through the Access Northeast Pipeline, is totally incompatible with the Supreme Judicial Court decision. Uh, so we're going to be making that argument wherever we possibly can. Uh, we hope this will be the final nail in the coffin of, of that project right there. Um, but now there's some, uh, a fair amount of latitude that the uh, Department of Environmental Protection has in terms of writing the regulations. The regulations don't necessarily have to be economy-wide, they, but they do have to um, be uh, calculated. We have to see that the, there are declining annual emissions uh, from, from sources so that we get to the, uh, to the target by, by 2020. Uh, so it's going to be interesting. We're, we're hoping that uh, folks on this call will uh, participate in the stakeholder process uh, and, and bring to the table some tangible ideas. It's important that the regulations be written soon uh, because I think the sooner we write them, uh, the more uh, likely we'll be of achieving them by 2020. We'll also be able to, uh, quite frankly, the regulations won't have to be as uh, strict or severe. The sooner we get them on the books, uh, the better. However, we also want quality regulations. We want to make sure we do this right. So it's going to require a lot of time and effort on behalf of not just the administration but ourselves. I would add, I really hope that the administration has been thinking about this anyway. They were required to do this uh, four and a half years ago. Uh, there shouldn't be new material for them. They should be able to look at uh, all the policies that they might have considered and uh, brush those off, perhaps do some uh, reanalysis and be able to bring those uh, forward in the near uh, future. Um, I have a slide or two that shows, um, if you could go one more, I guess, Pat. Um, we would have everyone reference uh, the Clean Energy and Climate Plan. That's a plan that's required under the Global Warming Solutions Act uh, every five years. The Patrick administration did one in 2010. Uh, right in front of you right now is the plan that was released by the Baker administration in January of 2015. So it's pretty fresh. Uh, and what it shows is uh, the amount of, um, of uh, tonnage, from, uh, million metric tons of, C of greenhouse gases from 1990 and what the target uh, needs to be in uh, 2020. Uh, but what's key is uh, in 2013, we know that we, we uh, achieved 19% of the uh, required reductions and now we've got to go another 6%. According to the Clean Energy and Climate Plan, which you can get online, uh, the administration's projecting that by 2020 we could either fail and be at 20% uh, which is 5% too low, or we may overachieve and hit 30% uh, by 2020. Uh, our view here at Mass Energy, and I think working with a lot of, a lot of environmental groups, that 25% certainly is achievable, but we've got to get moving. We've got to uh, pass 
uh, clean energy legislation, um, and we've got to touch on all the different factors, uh, buildings, transportation, electricity, uh, gas leaks, that's, a, that's one that I know a lot of people are concerned about, that's in the other category uh, in, the, in this chart. Um, and so uh, we anticipate there'll be a lot of discussion and uh, can answer any questions that people might have. That's great. Um, thanks, both of you. And I have a, a few questions uh, to clarify a couple of things. And uh, we've also been getting some great questions in from the participants. And I hope people keep sending those along. Uh, and I will be asking those of the presenters as well. Um, so, Larry, can you just clarify a couple of things for me in, in what you said? I've got two questions for you. One is, can you clarify uh, whether it's the DEP's responsibility to set annual emission reductions for the state as a whole, or if they have a specific obligation to do it by category or sector? Yeah, uh, the way we read it is that the administration is going to have to come out with a, uh, a number for uh, by the time they write the regulations, 2016 will be pretty much uh, in the history books, but they'll have to declare where we were uh, in 2014, 2015, 2016. Then they will have to set numbers for 17, 18, 19, and 20 that are lower than the preceding year. Uh, we think that's essential. So declining aggregate annual emissions. But then they can look to uh, the categories that, uh, that are listed, buildings, transportation, electricity, other, they can pick certain targets, uh, certain segments of the economy, and uh, focus in on those. And what their job to, is to uh, identify, ensure that there will be reductions in some subset of all those things that will meet the overall aggregate annual emission. So it could be that one particular sector uh, is leaned on to get most of the reductions, or and that, uh, um, and I, I presume that the department's going to be looking at things such as. Uh, viability in each sector um, on a practical basis and perhaps on a cost per ton basis, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. So, uh, but you know, it doesn't all it doesn't have to be, for example, 25% across the board. Uh, the inventory right. won't be done that way. So, they do need to set sector specific emissions targets, but they don't all need to be the same. Correct. Okay. Correct. Right. They do when you put them together. They have to add up the 25%. In, in 2020. Well put, great. Okay, and just talk to us a little bit about what, if anything, this SJC finding tells us about after 2020. Uh, the well, first of all, I think it was a great affirmation of the uh, importance of the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, it's not aspirational. Uh, they made that very clear in, in, in plain English uh, that it's the law of the land and that the 80% by 2050 is a Requirement. It's not a target. It's not an aspiration, uh, and so we think that's excellent. Um, that's that should bode well. It, I think it's going to help uh, clarify the viewpoint of uh, many policymakers about essentially where to go with uh, uh, anything that might affect emissions, either positively or negatively, post uh, 2020. Uh, I think the most important thing is that it's going to make sure that we hit 2020, uh, uh, hit the ground running um, as we head towards. Uh, post 2020. There's already discussion about amending the Global Warming Solutions Act to set up interim targets for 2030, and I, and I think it will be clear that you know we'll, this process will continue. Um, but um, it won't necessarily um, the regulations that are written in order to comply with this particular SJC decision won't necessarily be the regulations that uh, get us to 2030. It probably will set up an excellent model for that. Though. That's really helpful. Thanks. So. This is a question for, for you, Pat, but I, I think I can, I have this question kind of for both of you. It's about hydro, and by hydro I mean new, incremental hydroelectric energy coming to us from Canada, not the one we have right now, but more. So for both of you to think about this and then answer me in whichever order, how does this fit in to, to what you're talking, talking to me about? So Pat, how does it fit into uh, existing Reggie and how does it fit into the Reggie modeling, the Reggie 2.0 modeling, and then Larry, how does it fit in? How do we understand it under the SJC ruling? So sure. So that, that's a really good question, and I'm just going to flip back a couple of slides 
to uh, my slide that shows the different strategies that we modeled in, in Reggie 2.0. So uh, in this particular study, we looked at six different strategies or shifts to achieve emission reductions. Um, and that was chosen just because we were looking at specific strategies that we thought had significant economic potential, uh, uh, or had a significant amount of economically potential availability of emission reductions between now and 2030. Um, there are any number of other strategies that you could have looked at, including hydro. Uh, so a different way that we could have modeled this would be perhaps to uh, put uh, hydro in here as a strategy. And to give you a little bit of background about how we picked the strategies we did, uh, for each of these individual strategies, we looked at its uh, basically emission reduction, reduction potentials by the year 2030 and looked at the cost of achieving those emission reductions uh, in dollars per avoided ton. We stacked up all the different resources in terms of price from lowest price to highest price and then picked enough of them that we got to the level of emission reductions that were required in this modeling exercise. Now, it's entirely possible that you could redo this analysis with a completely different set of uh, strategies, including hydro, or you could see what would happen uh, in a future where hydro did exist by 2030, and then uh, see what strategies you would need to uh, achieve the level of 40% emission reductions by then. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you look at the 2010 plan by the Patrick administration and this plan by the Baker administration, um, hydro is in the mix uh, to a very heavy extent. It would be 4.2% of the 25% requirement by 2020. Um, and you know, a lot of folks uh, can quibble with the question of whether or not that hydro could be brought online by 2020. And I think that's a good question, uh, particularly if it's, if it's new construction with new transmission lines, that seems dubious. In which case, the, uh, the DEP is going to have to have um, other mechanisms in place. What, what, if, they can't, if, if they put that into the uh, regulations uh, in some fashion, they're going to have to have a fail-safe provision, I would hope. And if they can't get it in by 2020, what else are they going to do? Um, and like, just spell out for people, you said it was dubious. Spell right. out for us a little bit what, what makes you doubt. Well, uh, I, with uh, hydro, and actually in the plan, they refer to it essentially as uh, hydro or, or uh, zero emission imports coming from Canada or coming from out of New England. Um, and we could buy a lot more ex uh, hydro from existing facilities in, in Canada. That would be a question for a lot of folks who do uh, model greenhouse gas reduction. Is that a legitimate thing to do in order to reduce our emissions when perhaps there could be leakage uh, in Canada? You know, maybe Canada will send us the zero emission electricity and maybe they'll burn more fossil fuels on their side of the border. Uh, that's a good question of which I'm not an expert on. Um, but if they were to build new facilities, uh, how long would it take uh, to build a new uh, hydro generator in Canada and then to build transmission lines that would carry it uh, to uh, Massachusetts? Uh, could they use existing transmission lines to some extent? Uh, those are the questions that I think need to be sorted out uh, as to whether or not they would be able to produce uh, verifiable re greenhouse gas reductions uh, by 2020. And, and I, you know, my view of this is that uh, what the DEP will probably have to consider now is uh, re reviewing a proposal from a couple of years ago under the Patrick administration for a clean energy standard, which essentially might uh, uh, imply hydro, but essentially it's going to mandate a procurement of zero emission electricity in order to achieve uh, the uh, greenhouse gas reductions uh, that are necessary. Yeah. Um, let me ask another question that, that both of you can comment on. And that you're each giving slightly different presentations about current topics, but they each have something to say about the other. So uh, thinking from a Reggie point of view, what does the Massachusetts the, uh, SJC decision mean for Reggie? And then thinking from the Massachusetts point of view, you know, what, what does Reggie mean for, for us here in Massachusetts? So, it, it's, so this, my understanding of the SJC decision, and Larry, I hope you'll correct me if I get anything wrong here, is that uh, in the decision, SJC specifically says that Reggie itself is not a acceptable mechanism for achieving emission reductions in Massachusetts. And there's all kinds of asterisks 
associated with that. But the, but the key the key part of that is that Reggie deals with a pool of nine states, and on the whole, on the nine state regional whole, emission reductions can and will be achieved by the year 2020. But there is nothing in the program, and in fact, that it's a design feature of the program that no emission reductions will be constrained to any specific state, which means that Reggie cannot guarantee that emission reductions happen in Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, correct. And, and so the way we see the connection is that uh, while DEP cannot claim that Reggie is a, a qualifying policy for Section 3D of, of the Global Warming Solutions Act, uh, we all know what REGI does, though. REGI does uh, reduce uh, electric sector emissions, but it also creates a big bag of money that you referred to, um, money that can be used to support primarily energy efficiency programs in, in the Commonwealth. That's one reason why we have, uh, what, the number one ranking five years in a row on energy efficiency. So we want to keep that uh, money flowing to help in, uh, increase the likelihood that we would hit our goal in uh, 2020. And if anything could be done to expand REGI, um, before 2020, that would uh, be even better. So uh, maybe another way to say it would be uh, DEP could put regulations in effect for expanded energy efficiency or expanded renewables, and REGI as it currently exists or some expanded version of it down the line uh, could be used to help boost or, or fund those other programs that DEP uses as a regulation. Exactly, yes. So they're very closely related, but REGI itself doesn't meet the, isn't sufficient just by itself to meet what the SJC is asking for. Ex yes, exactly. And uh, I would say for folks uh, at the end of the presentation, um, the SJC decision is available online. Um, I think it's striking as to how clear they wrote the decision, and um, those sorts of new, uh, nuances are, are well explained by the SJC. Mm -hmm. And just one little other aspect of that. Uh, so should people in states other than Massachusetts care about our emissions drama here in the Commonwealth? Why, why do they care? Why does anybody else care about our SJC decision? Or if, if you don't live in Massachusetts, maybe you live in another reggae state, what, what does it matter to them? So, I mean, just to take the first crack at this, um, this table here on slide six shows what the regulations are uh, in the other uh, eight reggie states other than Massachusetts. Uh, like I said, uh, Delaware's target is a non-binding goal, but the other seven states at least have uh, regulations that are actually quite similar to the Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act. Everyone has its own special features and its own language that it's written in, but to be clear, these are all legally mandated required emission reductions. And I think that uh, state policymakers in each one of these other states should be taking a, a good look at the SJC decision and, and using it to inform their decisions about uh, putting in place regulations that actually get to the targets that are on the books. Uh, exactly. I, I also think that the regulations that are ultimately written uh, by DEP are, uh, should give some states, uh, quite frankly, excellent ideas on either how to pursue uh, a goal of 25% by 2020 or perhaps, you know, how not to um, if they see a flaw in the regulations. So I think it's going to help um, perhaps states go look, uh, either give them more confidence about expanding REGI or make them realize that there are elements outside the current REGI construct that need to be adapted, such as touching on transportation and um, things like gas leaks and all those other, making sure that we're looking at their inventory very well. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, uh, we've just been talking about the, the Reggie region right here, but, um, you know, there are plenty of other states in the country, and states like California, for example, have uh, its own uh, cap-and-trade emission reductions program, which actually uh, goes a bit beyond Reggie in the sense that it applies to certain emissions outside of the electric sector. Mm -hmm. um, so. I'm sure state policymakers in California can be looking at this. Other states in the Northwest are also uh, interested, as I've been reading, about joining possibly California's program or, or a different one. Um, and furthermore, as we look further down the road, uh, we've got the Clean Power Plan coming in 2022. Uh, there is some uncertainty, uncertainty about the Clean Power Plan right now, uh, what was it being saved by uh, the Supreme Court and all, but uh, DEP's actions today 
and making sure that Massachusetts gets to its 2020 emission reduction goals should be should be really taken, like Larry said, as a, a good first cut example of how other states might meet their clean power plant reduction targets um, just a couple of years from then. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And while we've been talking, we've had a flood of really interesting questions come in from the participants. There's some tough ones in here and some really interesting ones. Before I dive into them, I'm going to do a little housekeeping um, so we don't miss it at the end. Thank you. So uh, Synapse works on these issues and we hope you contact us and, and we can have wonderful conversations to talk more about that and what your groups and agencies are doing today and uh, how we might fit in with that work and, and collaborate together. So um, we also have a lot of resources up on our website that may be helpful to you. If you look around up there, you'll see all sorts of energy topics all over the United States. Um, we've got links here just to pull out a few things that are specifically related to this talk, both about uh, Reggie and some other New England issues and also clean power plant issues that you see listed up here that may help out. Um, and then this webinar today is part of a series of webinars and I just want to remind everybody that we've got three more webinars to go, one each week coming up. Next week is called Clean Power Plant New Policy or New Normal. Hopefully you find that intriguing. And you can look on our website to see a few sentence blurb about each one of these, let you know more information about it. So that's a good slide to have sitting there. I'm going to start bombarding you with all sorts of questions. Um, the first one that I have is about um, the Reggie State's greenhouse gas reduction goals. And it's asking, do all the states have binding goals in the sense of a state statute? Are some of them executive orders? Um, I'll let you answer this step, but first I'll remind you and myself that there's an appendix at the end of the Reggie Opportunity 2.0 that gives a specific citation for each of these laws. And I know I can't dredge up which one's which, but yeah. it's a really good appendix. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll echo that one right back. Uh, like, like I've been saying, uh, Delaware is the only one of those nine states that doesn't have specifically binding, uh, uh, legally mandated reduction targets. Um, all the other states are legally required to meet their uh, the reductions that they've put in place, uh, either in a statute or an executive order. And again, I, I don't have the uh, exact details at the forefront of my brain right now, but I would encourage you to go back uh, to that Reggie Opportunity Report uh, there, and there is an appendix which uh, lays out in great detail uh, each one of those nine states. So hopefully that's uh, helpful. Uh, reduction targets, yes. <laughs> um, another question about the Reggie modeling, uh, what was included in terms of retirement for nuclear units? And this question is specifically calling out New York nuclear units, but you could answer it more generally. Sure. So. Um, it's important to remember that our uh, Reggie modeling actually began um, back at the end of 2015, and then there's been a lot of really interesting developments in terms of uh, nuclear retirement specifically that have happened since then. Um, I'm just flipping through my notes right here. Um, let's see. So uh, we modeled uh, Pilgrim as retiring in 2019, so that's the large nuclear plant uh, down in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And as far as nuclear retirement in the state of New York goes, uh, we modeled uh, Fitzpatrick retiring in 2017. Um, and it's my understanding that there's uh, another nuclear unit uh, in upstate New York, it's the name of which is escaping me at the moment, uh, as well as Indian Point, uh, which we modeled as uh, sticking around through the study period of 2030. But again, uh, a lot is changing these days with the economics of nuclear units, and it's possible that a modeling exercise similar to this that we conduct at the end of 2016 would look a lot different than the one we do at the end of 2015. Yeah, and that's in a way the topic of next week's webinar is all of these recent developments in retirements, yes, in uh, fuel prices, uh, the different expectations going on to reach about fuel prices, about renewable technology costs all of those different expectations and what, how they change modeling of emissions in the future. Um, here's a question 
that I've gotten a couple of people asking me about methane. Um, so let's just clarify who and when and where that's being considered and when it's not for both of you. So in the Reggie modeling and in Reggie, are we using CO2 equivalents that include methane? When is methane in? When is it out? Um, also in thinking about Massachusetts. So uh, I'll let Larry take the harder answer. Uh, Reggie, Reggie is easier. Uh, Reggie looks at just CO2 emissions coming from centrally located uh, emitting units in the nine Reggie states. Uh, so we're just talking about CO2 emissions from the electric sector, and it's not any more complicated than that for Reggie. So no, just to really, really clarify it for people out there, there is, it's only looking at the emissions in the moment of generation, nothing what we would call upstream of that. Right. Of, fracking or what have you, other kinds of leaks upstream that would involve methane, it's only the CO2 in that moment when you fire up the generator. Right, and that's Reggie, but as I understand it, uh, the GWSA is, is quite different, right? Uh, well, it has a couple of implications. First, um, uh, it is a little bit confounding, but the reality is that if we were the natural gas that we import, if it's leaked outside Massachusetts, that's irrelevant to the greenhouse gas inventory in Massachusetts. And, uh, that might be frustrating for a lot of folks to, to hear who are advocating against uh, the gas uh, pipeline, but, uh, but at least we can think about that uh, subjectively or qualitatively, that we, we know those emissions are occurring. Um, what is relevant to the inventory and to the Clean Energy and Climate Plan, if you were to scroll back, uh, Pat, um, in that other category, uh, it's the fourth one down, uh, they're counting on um, uh, that 6% would come from other. Of that, uh, one-third is coming from gas leaks in the distribution system within Massachusetts. Uh, that's gotten a lot of attention recently. There have been stories about how Mothers Out Front and an organization called HEAT are using technology that Nathan Phillips of Boston University is uh, is put into use where we can measure gas leaks uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, and I think the amount of leakage is, uh, is significant, it's huge. I don't know if the, if, um, if the Clean Energy and Climate Plan is adequately uh, weighting how much uh, reduction we can have from, from, from uh, fixing the, the pipeline, the pipes underneath our feet. That ought to be looked at very carefully. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something, you know, Lori Ehrlich, a state representative from Marblehead, has been filing the legislation to try to increase the pace at which um, pipeline, uh, pipes are fixed in Massachusetts. Now I think the DEP has the authority by the, by the SJC decision to essentially uh, require a, a faster schedule of repair, or at least repairs, as, as we understand it, some, not all leaks are equal in terms of the amount of, of uh, greenhouse gases they would emit, uh, emit. so we, we should be taking care of the big leaks first. Uh, but it's very important. I think uh, people who are on this webinar would be aware that a methane leak is uh, causing uh, much more uh, greenhouse gas uh, potential than, than a carbon dioxide uh, emission, so mm -hmm. we have to address that. So, uh, I, so Larry, just so I'm clear on this, it sort of, sort of sounds like what you're saying that one of the levers or policies or regulations that DEP could put in place, um, as made clear by the SJC decision, is to regulate methane emissions coming from the distribution system within Massachusetts, but it sounds like they actually can't touch the fracked emissions that come from further upstream. Correct. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is the way that our climate law is written. So, so to touch any of that would require new legislation. Is that correct? Actually, uh, it, I don't think it's the um, Global Warming Solutions Act. I don't think it's specified that we would ignore emissions outside Massachusetts. I think that is a matter for, uh, and I mean this with all due respect, I think that's a matter for bureaucrats mm -hmm. to determine how to do the inventory. And so I think that possibly could be uh, uh, amended in, in, yeah. internally, but, but I'm not an expert on that particular item. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to actually agree with that reading of it, that if you think about what the laws themselves say, they require that the inventory method is used, but they don't specify the method. So right. I'm sure a whole bunch of people will start writing in right now to, to give their opinion about this, which yeah. may be helpful, but yeah, I, I'm, yeah I, I agree with your reading on the face of it. So, okay, here's another question for you, Pat. 
Just explain, maybe go back a couple times and explain a little bit more about how Reggie impacts on long-term capacity prices, just so everybody understands. Sure. So uh, the idea here is that, so in, in New England, we have this a structure called the capacity market. And this is a market that uh, occurs uh, three to four years out, depending on when you pick a starting date, uh, from a particular date. And it's put in place by the uh, regional system operator, ISA New England, and they operate this market to ensure that there is sufficient capacity to meet reliability issues in that point in time three years from now. So the way the market works is the ISO, the system operator, holds an auction, and all of the different resources in Massachusetts and the other five New England states, whether they're new or existing resources, uh, put in a bid to uh, participate in the capacity market and get put under that umbrella of the capacity supply obligation for the region as a whole. Now, where Reggie comes in is because Reggie acts like a funding mechanism to support energy efficiency and renewables, for every new energy efficiency, for every new unit of energy efficiency or unit of new uh, renewable that gets brought online, partially attributed to Reggie, um, Every new one of those units displaces a unit that would have otherwise be needed uh, from, in New England at least, likely a natural gas unit. So you can sort of step back from this and think that over time, as that new capacity is sort of getting added because of Reggie or partially because of Reggie, uh, less infrastructure is required from these other emitting resources. Yeah, and, and in that way, it gets to prices. So, so basically, um, the prices prices are are a way of getting there. So, uh, because and I, and sorry for for skipping over this particular detail, but uh, within the auction itself, um, prices uh, units that are coming online that are new that are natural gas combined cycle units, the type of natural gas units that are getting built these days, uh, require a certain capacity price um, in order to make them whole in order to. Uh, allow them to be constructed in order to get the financing that they need. And if those prices are too low, they cannot be built. Now, if you've got resources like energy efficiency and renewables that are coming online and are getting built because of mechanisms like the RPS, mechanisms like ERSs, or mechanisms like the funding attributed to REGI, uh, those resources might not need as high prices. So they cause the overall auction price to drop by a little bit. And that makes the overall economics that less attractive to natural gas and other emitting generation. And on taken at, with a long view, overall you would see less investment in those types of resources and more investment in the renewable energy and energy efficiency. Yeah, that's a, a very helpful explanation. Um, and it, it brings us right around to my next question, which I'm going to ask you, Larry, which is about connecting the dots for us between energy efficiency and the SJC decision and REGI, what, what can energy efficiency do for us to, to make these things possible? Is there more energy efficiency to be had? Have we already got all we can with Massachusetts is the, the star in energy efficiency? Is there, is there still more that can be had? And, and if so, what can be done with energy efficiency that actually meets the SJC's qualifications for an emission reduction? Right. Well, it's uh, pretty easy to calculate how much uh, greenhouse gas we would reduce by increasing energy efficiency. Um, we uh, have a program in Massachusetts called Mass Save that contributes a lot of energy savings. That, uh, but the benefit cost ratio, however, of of the programs that are run by National Grid and, and Eversource uh, are over three to one. We, we could greatly expand uh, those programs, achieve more energy savings, and I believe they're going to have the best economics of anything else left in the toolbox uh, for the DEP. And so, again, Pat, if you could go to that handy chart, um, it, you know, if they don't do energy efficiency, they're going to have to look at some of these other sectors, and, and, I, and I will say it they should look to the other sectors. But energy efficiency, I think, is going to have um, the best economics. And so I would, I would look at that, not just for electricity, but let's save more heating oil, let's save more natural gas. Um, and, you know, perhaps we could look at the investor-owned utilities, but perhaps also the municipal utilities as well. We could expand the energy savings pool uh, pretty well uh, in that regard. We might be able to use demand response as a way to 
uh, reduce emissions as well, uh, which is also allowed under the energy efficiency programs. Um, and, and so I think that's going to be uh, a key item. What DEP can do now is they can essentially uh, require uh, either the Department of Public Utilities or the or the utilities themselves, and, and uh, I'm not sure what which path they would take, uh, but to go back and to hit a certain target of, of greenhouse gas emissions. So the utilities might be directed not just to reduce kilowatt hours or gallons of oil, but they might be given a particular substantive uh, specific goal of greenhouse gas reduction, um, and that's something I would like to see, something that's uh, a metric that they can be uh, held accountable for. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question about uh, this pool of money that both of you have talked about that comes from, from Reggie. So Reggie, as I think we're all familiar with, uh, many of the people on the, the line too, it, it is, uh, works in terms of an auction. And uh, each time there's one of these auctions, there's a pool of money for that, but then there's a system for allocating that back to the states, and the states make decisions about how that's spent. And as you said, Pat, a lot of that is spent on funding renewables and funding energy efficiency in the nine Reggie states. So uh, somebody's written in with an example of a recent California cap and trade auction where the amount of funding that had been anticipated was not achieved. Um, and it's because the prices dropped and it, the pool of funding was much smaller. It had been uh, earmarked for certain you know, transportation uh, funding and that wasn't there, it wasn't available. What sort of issues do we have like that in the Reggie region in terms of we count on this pool of funding, uh, what happens if we don't have it in a particular year in terms of renewables and energy efficiency? And then I'll maybe just to clarify this for, for participants, what are the factors that can lead to that? Um, you know, what can make the Reggie price drop on us so we don't get enough funding or you know, other factors that are involved? So uh, this is actually a really interesting question. So um, for some people that might not be as familiar with Reggie, um, back prior to 2014, I believe, uh, the Reggie caps were actually much higher. And because of a few historical factors, uh, mostly relating to the cost of the price of natural gas, emissions in the Reggie region just really dropped off. Not really because of Reggie at all, just because that's the way the prices worked. Um, and as a result, in the last Reggie stakeholder process, the Reggie states got together and recommended to their state legislators that each of the state caps be dropped to sort of meet the new normal of uh, energy, uh, of, of electric sector emissions. So as a result, that actually had a lot of impacts on the prices associated with, uh, with the Reggie program and led to what you might call a real drop-off in the amount of revenue that was expected to be collected uh, by energy efficiency programs. So that's the sort of historical context here. Uh, where we're living now um, is in a place like uh, what the person who asked the question is describing, like in California, where you might run into uh, occasional jumps year to year in terms of the revenue that you would expect from uh, Reggie to fund your energy efficiency and renewable programs and what actually happens. Um, right now, Reggie funds uh, about 10% of all energy efficiency programs in the state of Massachusetts, depending on what state you're in and how the state has set up the Reggie disbursements, that can be really different. Um, in Massachusetts, at least, uh, Reggie is used as a funding source, but again, it's only 10% of energy efficiency funds. Uh, the other 90% comes from other places as well. And uh, so, so Massachusetts should, uh, on a parallel track, try to work to uh, strengthen, maintain the integrity of Reggie, doing whatever it can, maybe going to your uh, targets for 2.0. That would be wonderful. We, we support that. Uh, but the Supreme Judicial Court has made it very clear that regardless of how much money comes from Reggie to the Commonwealth, uh, that these declining aggregate emissions must uh, happen. And so uh, the DEP, needs to, uh, can do what I do, which is hope for the Reggie money, uh, but needs to ensure that the reductions happen. So uh, the efficiency program should be given a target that uh, is uh, set, you know, probably independent of whether or not uh, of any particular amount of, of Reggie money. Mm -hmm. And so uh, would you, both of you, would you agree that uh, 
while Reggie and GWSA and now the new decision from SJC come at the problem of emission reductions from different places, they act as kind of additional safeguards for each other, that they're, they're bolstering one another and also if something happens with one, like the Reggie price dropping out or what have you, there are other, that we have other protections to make sure that uh, the emissions reductions occur. I think safeguard is a good way to describe it. I think. Um, you know, the SJC has made clear that Reggie and GWSA are, are two very independent things, at least as far as Massachusetts is concerned, um, but they both have a lot of interplay and, and really do support uh, the sort of missions of uh, the two different policies. All right, safeguard is an excellent word. I also just think that Reggie makes uh, the Massachusetts uh, re requirement easier to reach, and that's the key. Um, so here's a question for, for you, Larry. You might jump in too, Pat. Uh, under the SJC ruling, could any kind of market-based mechanism work as an emission reduction regulation? So some kind of cap and trade separate from Reggie, a carbon tax, other, other things that are market-based mechanisms. How, how does that fit in? I think that Massachusetts should uh, adopt something like a, uh, a further cap and trade or this discussion about a, a carbon fee and rebate program. Uh, Mass Energy has signed on to that legislation and supporting that. Uh, but that is going to be in the same uh, family as Reggie, which is that would help uh, uh, enable the, the requirements to be met. Uh, I think the SJC was very clear in saying that Reggie by itself does not. Uh, is not a regulation that satisfies 3D. I recommend that people read uh, their decision that they would say the same thing. If the legislation about carbon fee and rebate was passed, that by itself would not uh, accomplish the requirement as well. It would uh, uh, help uh, level the playing field, right? It would discourage fossil fuel emission, uh, and that's a good thing. And it would provide a bag of money that could be used to support further carbon redu reductions and some other mechanism. Uh, and so we'd like to see it, but uh, there's going to have to be, it wouldn't be a regulation that would satisfy the SGC. In and of itself. By itself. Yeah, to be complementary. Correct. Okay. Right. I think I've got time for one more question here, and then we're going to wrap up. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining us on the line today. We had a great turnout and uh, a really good presentation. Here's my last question that I both think, think both of you can chime in on. Um, talk to us a little bit about reducing emissions in the transportation sector. I know we've been a lot in the electric sector here, but that heads to transportation sooner or later. Um, how does that relate, Pat, to the Reggie study? And then, Larry, um, the SJC decision is primarily about getting us to our emission reductions in 2020. Uh, how can transportation reductions take, play a part there? So just to hit the long-term view before Larry talks about maybe the bit of a shorter term, um, in our uh, analysis for uh, Reggie Opportunity 2.0, we looked at a future in which uh, one-third of all light-duty vehicles, so that's basically normal cars and, and regular person speak, uh, get replaced by electric vehicles uh, by the year 2030, and this is in the nine-state Reggie region. Um, and what we found was that uh, electric vehicles are, are a great way to achieve significant uh, emission reductions. Um, for every uh, car that you take off the road, uh, there is only a very small increase in overall uh, electric uh, uh, generation required to support those compared to what would be otherwise be being burned in that car's engine. Um, and if you're in a region like uh, New England and the rest of the Northeast, which is making a serious push towards renewables, uh, through a variety of other mechanisms, you can help assure yourself that uh, those electric vehicles are getting powered by clean energy and not by energy from, from coal or uh, perhaps natural gas. But that's, that's kind of a longer term. I'm, I'm actually really interested in what the possible impacts of vehicle electrification is in the view, view of the DEP. Uh, actually, in, in the Clean Energy and Climate Plan, I believe that the administration is admitting the fact that we're behind on hitting uh, even the 2020 goals for transportation, not let alone the 2050 goals. Um, and, you know, you just have to think about it, common knowledge, you know, uh, the MBTA is struggling and we're not seeing enough 
uptake in electric vehicles. Um, so we'd like to see some movement in that area so that we can uh, achieve more uh, transportation emission reductions. Um, but uh, it, it's kind of, I think the big play will be post uh, 2030 as, as well. We certainly hope that these regulations will essentially help, uh, if not uh, anything else, put a cap essentially on transportation emissions until the policies are put in place that will cause uh, deep reductions. I believe I read recently in Commonwealth Magazine that uh, state gasoline tax revenues went up uh, in 2015, meaning vehicle miles traveled are increasing, but all, you know, uh, pure gasoline consumption has increased. So that's going to change. That would mm -hmm. clearly is going to make the job harder in other sectors. Um, so that's uh, I'm disappointed to say that, but you know that's why we need the regulations uh, sooner rather than later. That's why they should have written the regulations when they were supposed to back in January 1st of 2012. Then you could, we could have a little bit more headway on uh, public transit and on EVs uh, than we do today. Well, thank you for that answer, and thank you both so much for uh, speaking on the webinar. And thanks all to everybody out there who's been listening. Please join us next week, uh, same day, so Thursday. It's at 2 o'clock. And we're going to be talking about uh, the new normal and thinking about clean power plans. So see you all then.